I'm Gabriela Fresquez, and this is Radar 2021. 58 years ago, this great nation passed the Equal Pay Act of 1963. It was designed to eradicate the gender wage gap, meaning equal pay for equal work between men and women. And that's exactly what it did. Obviously, that's not true. There's progress being made, but uh, you'll reach equality in, in, and I look forward to this day, uh, 2070. It doesn't seem like progress is moving quickly enough. Yeah, it, it has to come a lot faster. It's 2021 and the statistics on the gender wage gap, much like my natural ability to sugarcoat anything, are pretty abysmal. Today, women working full-time in the US are paid an average of 82 cents to every dollar earned by men, a stat that's remained relatively stable over the past 15 years. And for women of color, the numbers are worse. It most certainly is. On average, Latinas in the U.S. make 55 cents for every dollar earned by white, non-Hispanic men. That means they have to work twice as hard or nearly twice as long to take home the same paycheck. And nearly one in three Americans don't even know this gap exists. That's not true. Even when you account for occupation, education, experience, location, a pay gap remains. For every dollar earned by men, Black women earn 69 cents, Latinas 63 cents, and if you're Afro-Latina, maybe some average of the two? I'm, I'm not a statistician. Point is, it's not good. While a gap seems to be narrowing slowly for white and Asian women, Black and Latinx women, regardless of industry, aren't seeing much progress. The wage gap for Latinas is the biggest kept secret in the entire America. We're the least paid of every single sector in the country. And the issue is that understanding the whys, why are we paid less? Is it because the work that we do is less important, less well done, or is it all across? And here's the thing, the more we understand where the gap is, the better it's going to be for companies to be able to address it. And what we know is that low wage salaries, which is what you think and you associate Latinas with, those are not so badly paid differently. It's 85% of the dollar. So when you're in low wages salaries, the difference is not that big. The problem is when you start getting promoted. And every time you scale up in a corporate ladder, the, the less you are paid. And that is why the drop out of Latinas in the workforce in senior positions is so stark. In fact, there's an entire day of the year dedicated to raising awareness around this issue. Latina Equal Pay Day. This year, it falls on October 21st, marking how far into the year Latinas have to work to earn the same pay that their white male counterparts earned back in 2020. Meaning, it'll take almost 23 months for Latinas to catch up to what white men earn in 12. For Latina workers, if you were to work full time for 40 years um, and you were to look back over the course of your career, and add up all the money that we lose over the course of our career, it's on average more than a million dollars that we're not being paid because of the pay gap. Some argue that maybe the wage gap doesn't exist and that men are just going after higher paying jobs like CEO, heart surgeon, or engineer. Whereas women tend to go after lower paying jobs like female CEO, female heart surgeon, or female engineer. Underlying all of this is the misconception that Latinas are hit hardest by the gender pay gap simply because we work in lower paying positions or are less prepared from an educational standpoint. But even when we control for these factors, a gap persists. Latinas are facing a double burden of racism and sexism in the workplace, and that's why they're being paid less. There's nothing else that explains it. We look at, um, as long as Latinas have been in this workforce um, in the United States, they are not treated fairly. They're not paid the same. They're not promoted at the same rates. So I think that there are real problematic um, stereotypes and notions about those workers, right? I mean, we just came out of a terrible administration who was like openly calling people from these countries specific names. There's a lot of naysayers that say, well, it doesn't exist. It's not true. I've looked at you know, hundreds of different occupations. I've looked at different industries. I've looked at, you know, specific groups of Latina women and not a single one of them makes more 
than a white non-Hispanic man. So we're talking the typical Latina makes about 55 cents for every dollar that a white non-Hispanic man makes. I mean, we're talking about, you know, thousands of dollars every month, you know, tens of thousands of dollars every year. And when we're looking at a whole career, we're talking about $1.1 million. That's a lot of money. It's not just like lost earnings, right? She's missing opportunities to buy herself a home, to invest in her or her child's education. There's just lots of missed opportunities to invest in, you know, and to build wealth. Experts say it'll take Latinas over 400 years to close the wage gap with white, non-Hispanic men. So, unless you're some kind of mythical human, you probably won't be around to see it. We need to elevate the agenda because we're the minority within the minority. We're the least seen, the least paid, the least valued. When, uh, when we did a, a study on perception of the community, Latinas are seen as their physical attributes. No one thinks of us as great workers, hard workers, as mothers, as uh, smart. They think of us as sexy, beautiful skirts. And that's why actually the, the perception of Latinas has to be improved. The representation of Latinas has to be improved. So that means that corporate America has a role. They have to be more transparent. They have to be more accountable. They have to be more intentional about transparency in their, uh, in their numbers, about like understanding the pay gaps that they have. But we ourselves, we have to understand that our role is to be better in self-advocacy. How do I advocate for myself? Better at self-promotion. Latinos, particularly Latinas, we work hard. But it's impossible to talk about any of this without considering the effects of the pandemic. You know, the global phenomenon behind the Zoom cat lawyer, the great toilet paper famine of 2020, and like an entirely new appreciation for overpriced sweatpants, because it has significantly threatened economic progress for women in the workforce in general. In one year, the pandemic has put decades of the progress we've collectively made for women workers at risk. Our economy cannot fully recover unless women can participate fully. The toll of the pandemic on working women has been so significant, it's become known as a sh session causing over 2 million women to leave the workforce. And this isn't necessarily because women are being laid off more than men. It actually does fall on women disproportionately at home during this time period, the homeschooling, the, the cooking and the housework, et cetera, the childcare. The pandemic has brought to light that women working full time still bear the brunt of domestic responsibilities at home. Shocker. Which now includes supervising kids on Zoom, also known as the place where parents' patience and kids' social skills go to die. And women of color who are overrepresented in service-oriented industries like restaurants and hotels, the kind of jobs that can't be done remotely, were hit the hardest. In 2020, while national unemployment jumped to almost 15% overall, for black women, it jumped to almost 17%, and for Latinas, just over 20%. We have like 600 some thousand Latinas who've completely left the labor force. We also have 8.8% who are, are looking for work. But what's gonna happen when these women come back to the labor force, when we're all vaccinated, we all have childcare, they're gonna take the first thing that comes along, right? Because they haven't had the savings, right? They've been robbed of 45 cents on the dollar. Um, when they're applying, they're, they're, you know, it's gonna be hard to hold out for another offer or, you know, it's gonna be hard to try to negotiate that salary. It's gonna be hard to do those things because they need money right now. So this pandemic really um, threatens to widen the already wide wage gaps that we see by race and by sex. And if there's any sliver of optimism to be had, it's that proponents for closing the wage gap are finally gaining momentum, in part by leveraging the past year's events to pressure legislators both on a state and federal level. Because if historically high unemployment, unchecked police violence, mass protests, and an economic recession aren't the Monday motivation our elected officials needed, I really don't know what is. With the pandemic, it's obviously much more difficult because Latinas are among the demographic that has been pushed out of the workforce at higher numbers than any other working um, class person at this point in time. 
As we think about what it looks like post pandemic, it is going to be incredibly important that employers are thoughtful and strategic about what it means to bring Latina workers and other workers back to work in a way that is equitable so that they are not contributing to widening the gap or putting Latina workers even further behind. Because what we know is that when women workers leave the workforce, it is very difficult for women to return to work at the same um, salary or pay and at the same level. Do you think that, because I'm an optimist, um, is there any silver lining in the fact that yet again, the pandemic is putting such a large spotlight on these issues? I think that the silver lining, if there is one um, to this pandemic, is that first, there are certain classes of workers who are finally being seen and in word being appreciated, we still need to see the legal changes so that the workers who are being called essential are actually treated like they're essential and not just disposable. Efforts by advocates and legislators led to a host of new state laws in 2020 focused on addressing the wage gap. And just last month, House Democrats moved to reintroduce the Paycheck Fairness Act, federal legislation designed to strengthen the Equal Pay Act of 1963. You remember the government's initial attempt at gender pay parity that's been weakened by loopholes for about the past um, 60 years? It would do things like improve wage transparency and prohibit employers from asking about salary history. For more than two decades, we pushed, we battled to strengthen the 1963 Equal Pay Act. Nothing would make more of a difference to working families in this country. I cannot tell you how difficult it has been to break through on something so simple that men and women in the same job deserve the same pay. That's what this is about. A diverse workforce has become a major priority for corporate investors, and it should be. Companies who don't offer equal pay for equal work won't retain diverse female employees, which might explain why Latina-owned businesses grew 172% in 2017. Being a Latina is a part of my everyday life and everyday work. I actually helm three agencies, um, bi-coastal agencies, and one of them focuses on multicultural clients. There's so many proud moments that I've had throughout my career. Truthfully, the most you know, rewarding moment is giving an opportunity to Latinas in the field and seeing them grow into fantastic publicists. An industry like mine is shrouded, um, you know, by these glamorous events and amazing, you know, experiences that you get to have. But also it's an industry that has been historically closed off to Latinas. I think the immediate challenge for Latinas looking to get into a career like public relations or communications is just getting that foot in the door. Do your homework, figure out how to get your foot in the door, but don't limit yourself because you didn't see it at home or, you know, someone close to you didn't live it, which I think, you know, happens to an overwhelming majority of us. Closing the pay gap for Latinas is essential to corporate America's bottom line, something Maria Rios, president and CEO of Nation Waste Inc., the first multi-million dollar Latina-owned waste removal company in U.S. history, knows a little bit about. I was a very uh, young girl, of course, going to school, uh, living with my parents in El Salvador. My parents were entrepreneurs themselves. There were many safety issues at the time in El Salvador. And so or my parents decided to bring us to the United States. I remember uh, my job was to go to school, but then I helped my mom. She went to work cleaning offices. I used to go with her during the summer and help her. But I remember going to the high rises where she used to work cleaning. I sat down at one of the fanciest desks uh, in the places and, and, and kind of, you know, like one day, I want to own my own business, I want to be my own boss, and I want to have, you know, something good. When I met my husband, I was 16, so I didn't finish high school when I met him, so I continued going to high school. He waited for me to finish high school, then we got married. But I sat down with my husband when he proposed to me, and I said, yeah, I marry you, but this is what I want. I want to go to college, I want to finish my career, I want to own my own business. 
Then I went to the University of Houston to get my bachelor's degree. When you have children, it takes longer. When I uh, established the business, it was a business plan that I made at the University of Houston. You know, when I put this business plan together in waste management, that's a male-dominated industry, as I said before. When I decided to, to go into the business and even the banker, um, I brought the business plan, everything was approved. When it went to underwriting, the lady went outside, no, the gentleman went outside and said, uh, hi there, is Mr. Rios here? And I said, ma'am, Mr. Rios is not here, but he's my husband. He's not a signer to the loan. I'm applying for the loan. And when you go out there to the banks and they look for a male figure, not thinking that you're a female, that you can accomplish a male-dominated industry, you know, a uh, successful company like I have. Uh, so they switched the papers from Mario Rios to Maria Rios, because that's who I am. I'm Maria Rios. What we do here is open more doors for more women. That's the main goal, and that's my main goal. Because when we hire someone at Nation Waste, my company, we hire the person and we pay the person for the position that he's applying for. We don't see you as what color you are, what religion you practice. If my goal is to deliver that message. It's equal pay, equality. It's about getting the job done and, and your mission accomplished. As women, and especially women of color, well know, if we want to see change, we have to demand it. Hi, I'm Natalie Torres Haddad, Financially Savvy Latina, and these are my top three tips on what you can do to close that gender wage gap. First is have the research and know your worth. So look up statistics, find out what that glass ceiling is, and come prepared when you're asking for a promotion, when you're getting that job, and be prepared that you're going to hear no. And so when you come back and hear that no, you come back and say, well, this is how much value I'm bringing to the company. I have extra skills that my counterparts don't. This is a way that you not only show your worth, but that's a way that you can negotiate a better deal. So number two is make sure that you have an allyship. We're the people that are going to be able to brag for you, talk about all your accomplishments and cheer for you. They're going to brag for you and say, Natalie's been doing a great job. She's the one that gets the work done. She's here first. She's doing the, the grind and doing above and beyond. And guess what? It, it's almost more validating when you hear it from other people, right? And number three is make sure you have someone to to be able to talk to and not only share your ideas with, but that they're going to give you valuable feedback. As Latinas, we need that type of representation. And if you think about these three tips, this is something that's not only gonna help you close the gender wage gap, but it's really gonna increase your confidence gap because a lot of women, we deal with imposter syndrome. So understanding that if you're dealing with imposter syndrome, you can still go in there, ask for the money, and at least deal with those three things and in order to close that gender wage gap. There's a saying in Spanish that goes, Calladita te ves más bonita, which translates to, you're prettier when you're quiet. If that doesn't provide some cultural insight into how Latinx women have been shamed into keeping silent when their opinions are deemed unwelcome, I don't know what does. But hey, it's 2021, time for revisions. Like, how about, calladita, you will never get the competitive salary you deserve. Or, um, oh, calladita, you won't last a day in corporate America. Or wait, how about um, your voice is your most powerful tool and when you pay us what we're worth, te ves mas bonita. <laughs> that works, right? <laughs> I'm Gabriela Fresquez for Radar 2021. Thanks for watching Radar 2021. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below and let us know what issues are important to you. Because let's be honest, there are a lot of issues to choose from. <laughs> so, so many.